This armour is made from three sizes of scales, two in the body and skirts and shoulders, and one in the neck guard of the helmet. The main material is leather, the lacing is cotton. Uh, it's almost certain that either cotton or hemp would have been used. Uh, silk was used in Japan for very high status armours, but uh, it's unlikely that ordinary armours were made with silk lacing anywhere else. Surviving pieces of armour from the Han Dynasty um, from a site in Inner Mongolia dating to about uh, 140 BCE show uh, hemp lacing. Most surviving lamellar armours from Tibet have leather lacing and this was used in Japan as well and almost certainly it was used in Iran. Leather can be uh, brain tanned to make it soft and flexible and uh, flat laces are very successful uh, particularly in metal armour where the lace deforms to the shape of the hole and fits very tightly. Uh, one of the problems when you use laces that are smaller than the hole or round is that they move in and out of the hole in holes in each scale and this uh, causes rapid abrasion. Um, you will see here that I'm pulling the main body of the armour up onto my body. Uh, if I was doing this with an assistant, which is the normal way you put this armour on, you wouldn't lace up both sides, you'd only lace up one side. Uh, and then uh, you would put the armour on and, tight and have your assistant tighten the straps on the other side. The disadvantage of an armour like this is that it is really quite difficult to put on by yourself. Uh, but the advantage is that you can use it to fit uh, quite a few different people. Um, it's really easily adjustable. The, the, the cuirass is the main part that has to be adjusted to the body. In this case, uh, I made this armour more than 30 years ago and as you can imagine, I wasn't quite the same shape as I am now. Uh, the laces uh, aren't tightened because I can't physically do that by myself. Uh, turning around and twisting to reach the laces on the side is quite difficult. This is the main disadvantage of the armour. So therefore, um, by the um, 9th century, probably in East Asia, uh, this type of armour was superseded by um, armours that were open down the front. Uh, due to some misunderstanding uh, in Sung Dynasty encyclopedias, uh, a lot of these armours, uh, which are shown quite clearly, um, have been reconstructed as rear opening armours, which means that the skirts don't actually protect the front of the thighs and the back flap is actually used as a groin guard. I haven't seen enough uh, translated material on the captions to these to suggest whether this is because of the captioning, but uh, a careful examination of the armors and illustrations of armors at the time and armors on statues around tombs suggest that this was not the case. In the Early Ilkhanid paintings, such as the um, the 1313 Rashida Din's uh, collection of histories, the armour is shown in a way that suggests that the artists were not actually familiar with the armour that the uh, Ilkhanid brought with them. Uh, and at this point, the armour is shown with a, like a long split skirt uh, without any. Um, flap at the rear, uh, rather this it just opens up the rear and the, the way that the, the, the scales are shown is very schematic. Um, it's, it, I personally think this might actually represent an earlier form of, um, of armour that the uh, artists were more familiar with. The, this type of, the, 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 the later um, uh, pictures that you get um, you will see that there's um, a uh, tendency to show more detail in the lamellar and uh, you will also see that the kind of structure uh, as the, the two skirts covering the front of the thighs and going around the sides with a rear flap is the most, uh, most 
normal way of, uh, of depicting this. Later on in the Jalirid period and early uh, Timurid periods, it's even more explicit. However, um, it's sometimes possible to see armors that have straps on the side. Uh, this is uh, not necessarily an accurate representation of the armors that were around. It may um, reflect the um, artists using other paintings as a guide uh, and there's some indication that uh, Chinese paintings for instance were used in the uh, Sia Kalem album as a uh, template and then details from more local areas were used to fill out the, the, um, the paintings uh, so it's you have to be really careful uh, when you look at uh, paintings to assume you know, whether or not they're a real attempt at representing what the artist saw or if they're just an attempt to make it an interesting painting. You'll notice various coloured laces hanging off this armour. When I uh, made this, uh, I didn't cut laces off uh, when I finished lacing up a section. I left the uh, the pieces of lacing there. Usually I thread it underneath where it can't be seen. Uh, in this case on the neck guard I actually use them to tie it up before I put straps on. But the idea of, of leaving the laces uh, whole was that uh, if you needed to repair anything uh, you could just cut a piece off and thread it into the repair uh, area without having to carry around anything extra with you. They don't get in the way, they don't get tangled up in anything, so they're quite quite safe. The, the neck guard and shoulders I've attached together and you'll see when I take the armour off how they come apart. Uh, Stand-up collars on lamellar armour are really old. The, um, the uh, Hand Dynasty armour that I mentioned with the hemp lacing already had stand-up collars. This this was a um, uh, an armor made from the equivalent of thin spring steel plates. The some of the armors uh, in the the uh, surrounding pits of the tomb of Jinjiwang, the, the first emperor, uh, the uh, the terracotta warriors as they're called now, they show stand-up collars as well. You, you can see the advantages. You don't have to have as big a neck guard. Uh, the stand-up collar kind of sits underneath it. Um, I would say that there's not a lot of evidence for this in the Ilkhanid paintings. Uh, but since there are existing Tibetan lamellar armors with those collars not quite so prominent, uh, it suggests that it was a continuous practice and it may not have been something that uh, stood up to uh, stand out for the, the people doing the paintings. This is showing uh, shooting a bow with a closed quiver. You might notice I fumble at first. Uh, when you put the quiver on with the armour you can't actually feel where it is until you go looking to get some arrows out and uh, it took me a second to find the opening of the quiver. Uh, this is one of those things where if you have uh, an assistant, they position everything in the correct position. As you can see, there's no difficulty uh, drawing the boat a full draw. Uh, you can't use your ear as a gauge at the rear, but if you've been practicing shooting this way for a long time, all you need to know is you've got to draw. Well, what I'm doing is I can feel the arrow point. Here I'm changing stance from what uh, Islami calls this called a oblique stance to what they call an intermediate stance. This gives even greater clearance of the armour. I, I will say that uh, I wasn't shooting particularly accurately. This is the first time I've shot an armour in more than 20 years. Um, so I'm a little bit out of practice. Uh, and you'll see me lose my balance in a second, uh, showing that the, the weight of the armour, which is roughly 12.5 kilos, changes your balance considerably. Uh, but it's well distributed. You don't feel uh, unbalanced like when you bend over or anything like that. Taking the armour off by yourself is a little bit easier than putting it on. Um, 
here I've got the little duffel bag that I, I store it in, not the helmet, uh, the helmet doesn't fit. Um, the duffel bag is roughly the size of some um, saddlebags I've seen from Mongolia as late as the 1920s. Uh, it, it was just put on a camel or, or a pack horse. Um, you know, you wouldn't put this on your riding horse, on the back of your riding horse. It's, it's just another 12.5 kilos. It's just a little bit more than you need to be carrying. Uh, so armor was generally carried on pack horses. Um, you see this in, it's actually documented in things like the, um, the in the Middle East, uh, in, pre the Mongol invasion. Um, Kazagand armors, uh, which were male inside padded um, coats, were uh, generally carried in baskets uh, on pack animals and put on just before battle. Uh, or sometimes when you were going on a raid and you knew you were going to fight, you'd, you'd wear your armor immediately. As you can see, uh, without the skirts, this is still a functional armor, and uh, there are paintings from the Ming Dynasty showing people wearing just this much armor. Uh, or this much armour with the shoulders, um, showing how uh, it, you know, for footmen particularly, where you can, you're a lot more flexible. You could, uh, you didn't actually need uh, as much protection on your legs. It's actually documented in Japan that the hidate, the thigh armour that the, went with the Japanese armours in the, from you know, up to the. Sengoku Jidai and, and, and periods like that uh, was generally not worn on foot. It, it was, uh, I mean, it looks very nice, but it was considered that it um, made you less able to move quickly and get out of the way of um, missiles or spears or whatever people were using to inflict pain on you. Uh, as you can see, this folds down very flat. Uh, you might have noticed that there were black strips of leather on the bottoms of the shoulder guards and the thigh guards. And uh, this is common in a lot of armours uh, of that type. Uh, in the Tibetan armours that survive, it's, the leather is actually quite soft. Uh, its purpose is to protect the bottom of the scales from wear and tear on things. Uh, I must say that I found uh, it, it can be uh, quite useful. The, the I haven't got a lot of wear and tear on the bottom of the of the groin guard and the, the, the rear guard uh, on the uh, cuirass part of the armour, but then uh, the these scales are fairly thick leather and quite strong. Uh, but it, it might also protect, particularly with metal armours, other things from the armour, so that the armour didn't scrape on things like your horse when you mounted him, or um, your clothes and things like that. Metal armors generally the bottom of scales were wrapped in leather. Whether it was just lacing that went through a, a hole or a pair of holes at the bottom of each scale, or whether it was actually a folded piece of leather with holes in it that was essentially sewn on with the lacing on the bottom. On metal armor, this has two purposes it prevents the armor from damaging you and your clothes, and uh, it also, particularly with metal armour, reduces the noise. You, you may have seen people wearing rather beautiful metal lamellar armours um, uh, in the Chinese style, uh, on, for instance, on YouTube, and you'll notice that they actually make a lot of noise when they move. Uh, when you do metal armour as the original armour was done, with lace, lace, lacing on the bottom of the scale, or, or um, or with the uh, wraps on the bottom of the scales, that doesn't make very much noise at all. In fact, it's, it's pretty silent, and a male shirt actually makes more noise. Though, to be honest, a male shirt on a padded undergarment is quite quiet as well. As ex I'm not actually zipping this bag up. Uh, funnily enough, uh, some of the saddlebags I've seen from, from the Middle East actually have a form of kind of rope zipper, where uh, alternate loops on either side pull through each other uh, until they close up the opening and there's a, a single tie at the end that ties them up. It's, it's something like you see on some Chinese martial arts jackets too. Um, 
but this kind of thing would be just tied on the back of a pack horse, pack saddle or something like that, um, with your extra weapons. There's, there's, there's a few paintings showing this kind of thing being done. Um, and even Ilkhanid paintings in the Dietz album in, in uh, Berlin show pack horses with folding chairs and all kinds of things like that. So this is quite normal. As you can see, uh, with a little bit more careful packing, this can be just closed up into a cylinder. It's really quite uh, quite easy to use. I hope this has been useful.